This morning I'm going to preach what I'm going to call the first point of a two-point message. Now, that don't mean it's going to be short. It means I've got two points. I'm just going to preach the first point this morning. So I hope you'll come back this afternoon. Again, it's early afternoon service, 3.30. Now, you don't have to leave at all, but if you do leave, if you eat and need to go take a nap, or if you just want to go home after church, whatever, uh, come join us back at 3.30 as we have our early afternoon church service. We don't do this but once a year, but I hope that you'll come back. And other churches that aren't meeting, or even people that you know that go to another church, invite them to come join with us as well. Let's read three verses to get us started. The title of the message is Daniel Understood. Start at Daniel chapter 9, verse number 1. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Azuharis, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Notice in verse number two, towards the first part of the verse, I, Daniel, understood. I, Daniel, understood. If I've got my figures right this coming Thursday, the United States of America will celebrate its 250th birthday. 250 years as the United States of America. Now, to some of us, that seems like a long time. And for people that only live 70, 80 years, 280 is a heap of years. But when you compare how long America has lived compared to some of the other nations and empires of history, it's actually a very short time. The Roman Empire existed for over a thousand years before it fell. The Grecian Empire, depending on how you count when it started and when it ended, lasted from 1,200 to 1,300 years. So America's 250 years is rather small when you start stacking it against some other nations, some other kingdoms, and some other empires. Of course, the United States of America has never desired to be an empire. Our country has been content with being a nation, a country. Even so, America's influence on the globe, I would say, has been second to none. It seems like this country in the 250 years that it has existed has touched virtually the entire world, the entire planet that we live on, and has done so for many years consecutively in a row. Some people wonder, What's the source of America's great influence? And people have guessed. People have said, well, it's our military might. Others have said it's our wealth. Others, especially in these last years, have said it's our technology. And I suppose different people, for different reasons, have been impressed by the United States of America. And maybe those three have been what's impressed a lot of folks over the span of our country's existence. But if you're a born-again believer that knows your Bible, you know the true source of the power of the United States of America. It has been our God and the righteousness that he has lent to us. This nation has, throughout its entire 250 years, made no bones about it, no apologies for it. We have followed the one and only true God. Yahweh, some call him. Jehovah, some call him. Most Christians in this New Testament era simply refer to God through the name God or Jesus Christ. Our country has been built on the principles and the precepts of the Bible, of the Word of God. Now, I know there are people telling you that's not true today. They're liars. That's the way this country came to be, based on the Bible, founded by Christians. For many years, the term was used that we have Judo-Christian beliefs. Judo, referring to the Old Testament Bible, Christian, referring to the New Testament Bible, those two put together have been the foundation for our country these 250 years, and they're why we have been such a powerful nation, and why we have been such a wealthy nation, and why God has blessed us with so much technology. But if our righteousness has been the source of our power and influence, our unrighteousness is becoming the source 
of our demise. We have turned away from God. There was a time when you could honestly have referred to the United States of America as a Christian nation. Knowing everybody was never a Christian, still, because of the way the Bible influenced this country, we were a Christian nation. You can't refer to us that way any longer. We are a godless, Christless, wicked nation today. And I believe as righteousness was our strength, unrighteousness, if we don't do something quickly, will be our demise. The reason I've asked you to turn to the book of Daniel is because there was another nation in history that followed a similar path. In the book of Daniel, that nation, Israel, is actually further down the path than America is likely to ever go. Daniel's country, the nation of Israel, had started out as a nation of rags. They had become a nation of riches. Then they became a nation of ruin. And as Daniel is reading the Bible in these first three verses, he's aware of the fact that the nation of Israel is about to be restored. So it's like two mountaintops. They went from rags to riches to ruin, but Israel was going to be given another chance by God to go back to being a nation of status and riches. United States of America probably, probably won't get to see that second peak. And if people like you sitting in churches like this don't take a stand for God and let God fully control their lives, I can guarantee you there'll be no second mountain peak. But as Daniel was reading the Bible, he began to notice God was given to Israel another opportunity to be restored. America, we started as rags. We've gone to riches. Now we're sliding rapidly down into ruin. And I think we need to understand some of the things that Daniel understood. He tells us in verse number two, as I was reading the word of God, I, Daniel, understood. This morning, let me give you three things that Daniel understood. Three things that I think you and I need to understand. Number one, Daniel understood that the Bible was the Word of God. Daniel understood that the Bible, the book that you hold in your hand, was the Word of God. In verses 1 and 2, he tells us what he was doing. He was reading through the books and he was reading specifically the book of Jeremiah. That's an Old Testament book. Jeremiah lived approximately 80 years before Daniel lived. And, and the Bible says, as Daniel was reading what Jeremiah had preached and wrote, that's when he understood. He understood Daniel's, uh, excuse me, Jeremiah's prophecy, the one that's actually given. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verses 9 through 11. That's exactly where Daniel was reading at. In that portion of Scripture, Daniel was reading where Jeremiah said that God was going to send one of those great world empires, the Babylonian Empire, to come to Israel and to defeat it and to destroy it, to carry it away for a time period, a time period of 70 years, and then at the end of that 70 years, Jeremiah prophesied Israel would be brought back into the land and be given a, another opportunity. So as Daniel is reading through the book of Jeremiah, he comes to chapter 25 and he's reading this prophecy. He himself, Daniel, is an old man now. He was born in Israel. He was actually a boy when Jeremiah was preaching and preaching this very message. But Babylon did come, did destroy, did conquer Israel, did carry the captives back to Babylon. And Daniel now as an old man, maybe in his 80s or his 90s, is reading what Jeremiah wrote. And he understood the 70 years are almost up. He knew what Jeremiah wrote was about to come to pass. Why? Because he knew the Bible was and is true. Now think with me for a moment. If you've ever talked to unbelievers about the Bible, quite often they'll make some very absurd statements. 
They'll make statements like, man wrote the Bible. They'll make statements like, well, the Bible wasn't even put together until two, three hundred years after Jesus Christ died. People didn't even know that these books were inspired or given by God. Man just got together in some monastery someplace two hundred years after Jesus died, and they just put it together. The whole thing is a work of man. But would you notice, Jeremiah, a captive in a foreign language, in a foreign land, several thousand miles away from Israel. The Bible says in verse number two, he was reading the books. What does that mean? He was reading the individual scrolls that each of the men of God had written before him. He was reading what Isaiah wrote. He was reading what Amos wrote. He was reading what Jeremiah wrote. He was reading what Moses wrote. Why was he reading those scrolls? Because he knew they were the Word of God. He was reading a book that wasn't any more than 80 years old. I don't know that he ever met the man Jeremiah. He would have been a young lad, maybe 10, 12, 15 years of age. But he was taken as a captive as a young man from the nation of Israel. So he was in the same city at the same time Jeremiah was preaching this message. And he knew Jeremiah was a man of God. And he knew what Jeremiah wrote was the Word of God. And didn't nobody have to wait 200 years after Jesus Christ died to know that the Bible is the Word of God. People have always known that the men of God who were filled with the Spirit of God were writing the Word of God, and they've always treasured it, and they've always believed it. Could I just tell you, the next time somebody comes up to you and says, men got together 200, 300 years after Jesus died and put together the Bible, would you just tell them they don't know what they're talking about and show them what happened in the book of Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel is teaching us a truth God's people have always recognized God's Word as being inspired. But, having understood that, let's ask a couple of questions. Number one, how did God know what was going to happen to the nation of Israel? I mean, here's God speaking to Jeremiah, and I'm going to use the figure 100 years before Daniel, just to keep it rounded off. It's probably closer to 80, but I'm going to use the figure 100 years before Daniel, and God spells out to Jeremiah what's going to happen. Babylon is going to come from a long distance away, going to conquer you, defeat you, take you away to their land. You'll stay there for 70 years. Then God's going to bring you back into the land, and He's going to give you another choice. How did God know what was going to happen. Now, I can sum this up for you in a short phrase. Because God is God. Amen. Because God is God. But I want to teach you something a little bit more than that. So, I'm going to give you a little bit more than just that simple answer, God is God. How did God know what was going to happen? Two things. Number one, because God makes some things happen. God makes some things happen. And number two, God knows everything else that will happen and has a plan for it. Let's talk about both of those. Number one, God makes some things happen. I don't know if you know it or not, but God's God. That means God's all-powerful, God's sovereign, God's in control of everything. And yes, God does make some things happen. He does not make everything happen. He does not make any individual reject Jesus Christ. He does not make any individual do anything bad. He can't do those things. You say, preacher, how do you know? Because James wrote, James chapter 1 verse number 13, that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man to do evil. To reject Jesus Christ is evil. God would never do that. It's against His nature. So, God won't make anybody or any nation do anything that's wrong, evil, or wicked. He does, however, make some things happen. From time to time, God works in the hearts and the minds of people to get them to do things that He wants them to do. 
We're not really preaching about individuals today. We're preaching about nations. Daniel was reading a prophecy not about himself. He was reading a prophecy about the nation of Israel. Today is not my birthday. Today is the birthday of, uh, of the United States of America. So God not only works in the hearts and the minds of individuals to cause them to do what he wants them to do, but God also does work in the hearts and the minds of entire nations through events and circumstances to cause nations to do what he wants them to do. Now that blows your mind, I understand. But God is sovereign, God is all powerful, and God does make some things happen. And if that bothers you, best I can tell you is get over it, because that's just what God does. But then beyond that, God knows everything that's going to happen. Has it ever dawned on you that nothing's ever dawned on God? God has always known everything. But there's more to that statement. And God has a plan for it. It's not that He just knows everything that's going to happen. God has a plan for everything that He knows is going to happen. Let me give you three thoughts. I want you to kind of keep these in your head. Write them down if you want to, but keep them in your head. Number one, God's purpose. Number two, your choice. Number three, God's plan. God's purpose, your choice, God's plan. God's got a purpose. God had a purpose for the, for the nation of Israel. You want me to tell you what God's purpose for the nation of Israel is, was, and is? God's purpose for the nation of Israel is the same as it is for you. It's the same as it is for me, and it's the same as it is for the United States of America. He's got the same purpose for everybody and everything. What's God's purpose? God's purpose for the nation of Israel, for the United States, is that we would honor God and obey Him. There's never been a human being ever born, not one, not ever, not at any time, not in any dispensation, not in any country that God ever had a different purpose for making them. God's purpose for making everybody is that they would honor God and that they would obey God. God's purpose for the nation of Israel, that they would honor Him and obey Him. But God does give choices. Israel had a choice. God made them with a purpose, but God's given them a choice. You can either honor God and, dis, uh, and obey Him, or you can dishonor God and disobey Him. By the way, you've got the same two choices. You sitting here today, God made you for a purpose, to honor Him and to obey Him. You make the decision whether you'll do that or what. By the way, you can't, make a, uh, you can't make a choice God doesn't give you, but you can make the choices God did give you. And this is your choice. You can either do it or not do it. That's the only choice you've got. Number one, God's purpose. It's the same for everybody. It's the same for every nation. Honor Him, obey Him. The choice. God gives every nation a choice. God gives every individual a choice. You can either do it or not. Number three, God's plan. Regardless of what choice you make, God's got a plan for you. If you choose today to start honoring God and obeying Him, God's going to bless your socks off. God's going to save your soul, adopt you into His family, fill you with the Holy Ghost, give you a mansion in heaven. God's going to call you one of His own, anoint you with His Spirit, call you to do mighty works. God has a plan for you if you will surrender to His purpose. You've got a choice, but God's got a plan. However, God's also got a plan if you say no. God had a plan for the nation of Israel. Jeremiah, a hundred years before Daniel stood on Jewish soil and preached to Jewish people that if you don't do God's purpose, you've got a choice. If you as a nation won't do what God put you here to do, God's going to bring Babylon up here. Babylon's going to destroy you, defeat you. Babylon's going to conquer you, take you back, what's left of you, back to the land of, uh, uh, of Babylon, keep you there for 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, God's going to bring you back into this land. And guess what He's going to do? He's going to give you the same choice all over again. So God had a plan for Israel. God's got a plan for you. God's got a plan for the United States of America. Same purpose for all of us. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how stubborn you are. I don't care how much you do know, how much you don't know. I don't care how many times you've, you've, you've claimed to be saved, how many years you've claimed to be saved. I don't care how many times you've rejected Jesus Christ. God's purpose for every human being, for every nation is still the same. God wants you to honor Him and to obey Him. And the first step of that is getting saved. It's your choice, though. He won't make you do it. 
He's got a plan. You get saved, he's going to bless you. I don't know what he might do to you if you reject him. Not immediately, but he's got a plan. I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be pleasant. It never is when you fall into the hands of an angry God. It's never pleasant. But I can tell you how your, your, your life will end. That's not exactly the right term. I can tell you what your end will be. If you keep rejecting God and rejecting God and rejecting God, refusing to honor him, refuse to obey him, refusing his son, you will die and you will go to hell. You will stay in hell to the great white throne. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 15. You'll be brought out before God to be judged. Then you'll be cast in the lake of fire forever and forever. That's ultimately the plan that God has for every person that will not honor him and obey him. Now, you might live another 50 years. There may be a whole lot more hurts, a whole lot more sorrows, a whole lot more problems between now and then. But ultimately, if you keep rejecting God, that is what will happen because God's word is true. First question, how did God know what was going to happen? Well, because number one, he makes some things happen. Number two, he knows everything that's going to happen and he's got a plan. So Daniel, reading the Bible, began to understand Israel had a choice. They made the wrong one. God's plan was to send them away. Now the 70 years is almost up, so it's about time for them to go back into the land. Daniel understood the word was true. Second question, why does God make known his plan? Daniel's reading this, and he's understood God's word is true. God's got a plan here. Why does God tell us his plan? Why does God let us know what's going to happen? I want you to listen to me real, real careful. I want you to listen to me real careful. Why did God do it to Israel? Why does God do it for me? Why does God do it for you? Why does God tell us what's going to happen? Because God doesn't want you to make the wrong decision. God wrote it in a book, black ink on white paper. It's been around for 2,000 years. You could go pick it up in any, any bookstore in America. You still can. Best-selling book that's ever been written. God's put churches on every street corner of the, of the South, at least. He's called not-headed preachers like me to come scream at you what the Word of God says so that you can't run away from it and you can't hide from it. He's called us to do vacation Bible schools, to go away boys and girls in, to teach them when they're small. God's not trying to do anything behind your back. God's, God's, a, God's a God of full disclosure. There's no trick to this. There's no, there's no secret code. There's no hidden message. There's no secret handshake. No, no, no. It's right there in the book. God wants us to know what his purpose is for every human life. It's the same. And change. Yours is the same as mine. The specifics may be different, but the general plan is still the same. He wants us to honor him and to obey him. God wants us to know, I gave you the choice. You get to decide whether you do it or whether you don't. And God wants you to know there's a plan if you don't. And while I don't know all the steps, I do know how it's going to end. If you don't, there's a miserable eternity ahead for you. Why? Because the word of God is true. Daniel understood the word of God is true. Number two, Daniel understood the decision was Israel's. The decision was Israel's. Daniel's reading along, and he sees what God's plan is. And, and the next verse tells us he falls on his face. He sets his face towards God, and he begins to pray. What's he praying for? He's praying that God would do whatever God would do. Like I said, he makes some things happen. He's praying that God would do whatever God would do to cause Israel to make the right decision the next time they get a chance. He's praying not that he'd make the right decision. He's praying not that God would make the right decision. He's praying that God would help Israel to make the right decision. You know why? Because it's not his choice. He's just one man. Now, he needs to make the right choice. He needs to use his influence to help others to make the right choice. But he can only decide for one man. He can't decide for the whole nation. But neither is this God's choice. 
God's committed that decision in the hands of men. If you're here today and you're lost, it's not God's choice for you to go to hell. It's your choice. If you go there, you'll go kicking and screaming against the will of God, against the work of God, against the heart of God. Because God's doing everything he can to get you out of hell and to get you into heaven. It's our choice where we go. It's Israel's decision what happens to them in the future as it's America's decision what happens to us right now. Now, if I were to ask you, you might would think I'm preaching about Israel. You might would think I'm preaching to the Jewish nation, but I'm really not. I'm preaching about America. And I'm preaching to Americans. You see, just like God had a purpose for Israel, so God's got a purpose for America. And just like God's given a choice to Israel, so God has given a choice to the United States of America. And just like God's got a plan for Israel, so God's got a plan for the United States for America. And it's America's decision what America will do. I can decide for me, I can use my little sphere of influence to get as many people as possible to go with me to heaven, but I can't decide what the United States of America is going to do. America has to make that decision. Truth of the matter is the United States of America is not mentioned by name anywhere in the Bible. You will not read it from cover to cover and find United States of America anywhere in there. You won't find our shortened name, the United States, or our other shortened named America. It won't be in there anywhere. That's not to say that we're not referred to in some, some manner or the other. God often speaks in parables and in symbols, and it may be that symbolically the United States of America might be mentioned somewhere in some obscure text. But it really don't matter if it is, because nobody's going to know it until it's too late to do anything about it, okay? It's hidden, and it'll stay hidden. So for all practical purposes, the United States of America is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Yet, we're talked about because we're like so many other nations. Take your Bible. You won't need to keep Daniel chapter 9. I won't come back to it to this afternoon. But go over to the book of Psalm, if you would. The book of Psalms. Let's read some verses that talk not just about us, but about nations like us. Go to chapter 50, verse number 22. Psalm chapter 50, verse number 22. Psalm 50, 22. I'm going to read. God speaking, now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver you. I'm going to read it again. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver you. Is that talking about us? Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. That is talking about any individual and any nation that knows God and then forgets the God that they knew. Go backwards. Psalm chapter number 9. Psalm chapter 9. Psalm chapter 9. Look at verse 17. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell... And all the nations that forget God. Is that verse talking about us? Is, it doesn't mention our name, but is it talking? About, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's talking about us. Any nation, any individual that's wicked. It doesn't matter whether it's an individual or a nation. Any nation, any individual that's wicked. What's God going to do? He's going to turn you into hell. Now, those two verses tell us what God's purpose is for us now what our choice is right now, and what God's plan is for us right now if we choose to disobey God's purpose. The first verse gives us present tense. The second verse gives us future tense. Right now, if we forget God, we don't have to forget God. The United States of America does not have to forget God, but we are forgetting God. We've got people that are teaching us we weren't founded as a Christian nation. God's a myth. He doesn't exist. We just exploded and bang, we're here. And all kinds of, of, of garbage, okay? That's the nicest term. Uh, all kinds of just wasted, lying, untruthful things. And America is forgetting God. If we forget God, what is God's plan? we got a choice. We don't have to, but what's God's plan? What's He going to do? He's going to tear us to pieces. 
To be absolutely honest, I'm not, I'm not so sure he hasn't already begun tearing us into pieces. But not only does he tell us what his purpose, our choice, and his plan is present tense, that second verse, chapter number 9 tells us what's going to happen in the future. What happens in the future? If we don't get his purpose, well, his purpose is that we accept him, that we follow him. But if we continue to be wicked, the choice is ours. We can do that or not. But if we do, he's going to turn all nations that forget him into hell. In those two verses, God just told us, the United States of America, didn't call us by name, but he just told us what is happening to us right now and what is going to happen to us in the future. He's going to continue as long as we forget him to rip us into shreds and there's none that can deliver us out of his hand. And if we continue down that path, he is going to cast the nation, not individuals now, he's talking about nations, into the very pits of hell itself. Now, I preach this kind of message quite often. It's not a very popular message. But I preach it a lot around patriotic days. Why? Because God wants us to know. That's why he wrote it in the book. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, preacher, you know, I know America's not what she used to be. But I don't think God would judge us any worse than he would judge some of these other nations. I mean, let's face it, we're not even as bad as some of these other nations. We're not like these Islamic countries, these terrorists that just go around cutting off the heads of kids and women and, and innocents. We don't do stuff like that. And you're right. You're absolutely right. By our standard, we're not as bad as they are on that scale. You might also say, well, we're not like those communist countries that oppress their people, steal their money, and, 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 and then let the folks just die of starvation and, and famine. We're not like these wicked countries. That, and you're right. You're right. On a human scale, on our minds, we're not as bad as them. But I got news for you. God doesn't judge on our scale. Take your Bible. Go to the book of Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12, we're going we're gonna to jump into the middle of a parable. And there's two people in this parable. One who knew the will of God and didn't do it, and the other that didn't know the will of God. Both of them now are before God being judged. In this parable, one that knew the will of God and didn't do it, one that didn't know the will of God, did bad, but he didn't know the will of God. Now they're being judged. Pick up at verse 47. Luke chapter 12, verse number 47. This is the servant that knew the will of God and didn't do it. Verse 47, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be be beaten with many stripes. Oh, he's going, to get, he's going to get some judgment poured on him. Look at the next verse. This is the guy who didn't know. Verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto, whom so, for unto whom soever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they shall ask the more. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who got the worst licking? The one who knew the will of God and refused to do it, or the one who didn't know the will of God and did things just as worthy of a beating? Who got the worst? The one who knew. The one who knew what God wanted but refused to do it. Take your Bible, go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10. While you're finding Hebrews chapter number 10, I'm going to read from Amos chapter 1. You go to Hebrews chapter 10. Excuse me. Amos chapter 3. You go to Hebrews. Amos chapter 3, verse number 2. God speaking. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Talking the nation of Israel. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. If there's ever been a country in these New Testament days that God has known. If there's ever been a nation that God has known and loved and blessed, it's been the United States of America. What's he saying? I've known you. I'm surely going to punish you. Look what he says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse number 26. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation 
which shall devour the adversaries. That's three Bible passages that I'm giving to you to try to express to you that God holds those more accountable that know His will and refuse to do it than He does the wicked heathen of the world whose acts and actions may be worse, but they didn't know they were. I got a notion that when God's judgment begins, it's not going to begin in the Islamic world. It's not going to begin in the communist world. I got a notion it's going to begin in these countries that call themselves Christians, but they have forgotten their God and they're filled with wickedness and God's going to rip them to shreds. And in the end, he's going to cast them into hell. And there's not a soul that's going to be able to change his mind because that's God's plan for those who know better and refuse to do what he tells them to do. There's another verse. It takes too much time for you to turn, so let me just read. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Where's God's judgment most likely to start? The house of God. I know America's not a Christian nation, but the, we're still the closest thing this world's got to a Christian nation. If God's going to pick any nation out to pour His wrath upon, it's going to be us. It's America's decision. It's not God's. God's got a purpose. I want you to honor me and obey me. God gave a choice. You can or you don't have to. But here's God's plan. If you will, America, if you will, the kind of blessings that I have heaped on you for 250 years, I'll heap them on you again. But if you won't, if you won't, I'll cast you into hell and there's not anybody or anything that can stop me from doing so. I will pour my wrath upon you and rip you in shreds and I will destroy you mercilessly. Why? Because... It's up to us. Now, I know none of these verses mention the United States of America. None of them have my name on them. None of them have your name on them. But I hope you do understand why some of us hellfire and brimstone preachers still preach that America is going to face a fiery judgment from God if we don't repent and turn back to God. It's because of these other verses that the Bible just says concerning all nations, and we do fit into those scenarios today. Number one, Daniel understood. He understood the Bible is the Word of God. Number two, Daniel understood. He understood the decision was Israel's. I hope you understand the decision is America's. Number three, Daniel understood the time was at hand. Daniel is reading in verses one and two, he says the 70 years are almost up. They're not up yet. But Daniel doesn't wait till the 70 years are up. He falls down on his knees and he starts praying right then. You know why? Because he realized there wasn't a minute to waste. Another decision time was coming for the nation of Israel. A time when God was about to bring them back into the land and they could do a, a nose lift. They've been doing a nose dive. They could turn that throttle and, 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 and the nose of that plant and start shooting straight back up. They could get the blessings of God again, be restored with the favor of God again. But they're going to have to make the right choice. He understood. No time to waste. So he began to use his Bible and his faith to ask God, to beseech God, to pray to God, God, please do whatever you will do. I'll do whatever I can do, but God, you do whatever you can do to cause Israel to make the right choice the next time they have an opportunity. He realized time was at hand. I want you to get this. You and I don't have a promise of a change in direction. Jeremiah gave a promise to Israel after 70 years of ruin God has promised you're going to go back into the land and you get to decide again what's... God didn't promise the United States of America that. He didn't tell us in 70 years or in seven seconds. He left us at this place. Any nation that forgets me, I'll rip them into shreds. Any wicked ones, I'll cast them into hell. We are on the nosedive going down. My friend, if Daniel realized even before it was time to make a decision to, to start doing right, that there was no time to waste, how much more so should you and I realize 
as we are nose diving in the very pits of hell itself, how much more should we realize the time is at hand. If you're going to do anything for Jesus, you don't need to wait next month, next year, next, next spring. You, the time is at hand. Let me ask you a question. Thursday is America's 250th birthday. Would you like to see her have 251? Because I'm telling you, I'm not sure we're going to hit 250, let alone 251, and that's just five days away. The truth of the matter is we are on a slippery slope, and God has promised us no reprieve at all. You say, preacher, is it too late? Is it too late? We're going down. You look at the world around us. I can't believe, I can't believe. Some of you are too young to know where we were just 50, 60 years ago, but I can't believe it. Knocking on doors yesterday. Go to this trailer. Two gay pride flags flying out in the front yard. Go up on the porch to knock on the door. There's a big placard there. Uh, if it's not your uterus, it's not your choice, which is a pro-abortion sign. So I know what's on the inside of that. Some kind of a liberal homosexual back, and they've got that all out in their front yard. And I'm thinking to myself, 50 years ago, they wouldn't have dared do any of that. Nowadays, if I say anything about it, I'm liable to get arrested as a bigot and a hater. I don't hate them. I wasn't knocked on the door because I wanted to invite them to come to our church. They might not have liked the message they had heard this morning, but I wanted to invite them to come to our church and to, to meet Jesus Christ. Is it too late for a country that don't know boys from girls? I'll tell you something that's starting to bother me as much now as that, this furry business. We've lost so much sense. We don't know boys from girls, but we don't know humans from animals. We don't. We're telling our kids they're dogs. They're putting potty trays in the public schools systems so that their kids can go tinkle in, other, uh, in, a, in a cat box or a dog box because they're teaching their kids that you're an animal if that's what you choose. We've just gone plain stupid. Amen. I mean, we have lost our marbles. It's not just the guy who's in the office that's done. I mean, we've all, apparently, uh, all the screws have come loose in this country. Is it too late? Go to one more Bible verse. Go to the book of Jeremiah. This is the book that Daniel was reading from. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah, prophet of God, inspired by God, writing the Holy Word of God. He's telling things about the present. He's telling things about the future. His present, of course, is 2,800 years ago. But the future things still apply to us. Look what he said, what God said through him in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse number 7. Jeremiah 18, 7. At what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Is it too late? Not according to the Word of God. God says, even if I have already made the pronouncement that I'm going to pluck them up and destroy them, even if I've already begun the task of doing it, if they'll repent... I will repent of my decision. I'll change my actions, and I'll stop my judgments. I think America is already being destroyed by the hand of God. But it's America's choice, not God's, whether it'll continue or not. There's two things America needs to do. And I'm, I'm wrapping it up. Number one, America's Christians need to be revived. Now understand... Well, I'm asking God to revive our country. I'm not just asking God to keep us where we are. Where we are is not good enough. We're losing ground where we are. That's not revival. Revival means God's going to have to do something inside of our hearts that we're more determined to live for God than we have been living. More determined to pray, more determined to witness, more determined to get away from sin, more determined to come out of this world, more determined to devote ourselves to Jesus Christ. Revival is not just going to church and getting a tickling up and down your spine when the preacher preaches. If that's all it takes, I'll hook you up to 120 and buddy, we'll get us one. <laughs> Revival 
is us understanding that God deserves everything we are. And we hadn't had one of those in this country. Well, to my knowledge, I've not ever seen one in my 50 years of being a Christian. I know people have these little movements here and they think that's, a, that's not a revival. That's that feeling. They're having the feelings. Great for the feelings, but that's not doing our country one lick of good. What does America need? America needs some Christians to get revived. America needs some folks sitting in the Green Pond Baptist Church to come to the conclusion, I can't keep living like I've been living. If I keep living like I'm living, this world's going to go to hell. America's going to be damned. Our kids are going to have no country to live in. God's going to cast this whole place in the very pits of a burning abyss. God needs more than what I've been given to Him. If that don't happen in the Green Pond Baptist Church, a good church, a godly church, one of the best churches I think on the face of the earth, but if we don't get revived and give God more than we're giving Him, we're going to lose the whole ball of wax. Number one, what needs to happen? America's Christians need to be revived. Number two, America's lost need to have a spiritual awakening. They can't get revived. Revived, re, means do it again. Five means alive. They can't be made alive again. They hadn't been made alive once. You don't get alive and you get born again. They need a spiritual awakening. They need to see that they're lost, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them, that they need to repent of their sins and surrender themselves to Jesus Christ. And there's a world all around us today who think they're going to heaven and they're not. They think because they got their name on some roll someplace that that ensures their, their place before God, but they've never surrendered themselves. They've never ever believed to the place it changed their life. And without such salvation, you've got no salvation at all. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If there's been no change in your life, there's been no Christ in your life. And sitting inside this room this morning are probably people who think you're going to heaven and you're not. I sat in a church just like this for years thinking I was going to heaven and I was as lost as lost could be. And the proof was in the fact there was no change in my life. And if you honestly look at your life, you can tell there's been no change in your life either, except you go to church every once in a while. Friend, that's the best change you've got. You've got no change at all. I go see a mechanic every once in a while. I go to the bank every once in a while. They don't make me a teller. They don't make me a mechanic. It takes more than just showing up to church on an occasional Sunday. What does America need? America needs what Daniel came to understand. What do you understand? The Bible is the Word of God. It's written for our benefit. God wants us to understand all these things. Daniel understood it's our choice. God's not going to make it for us. You're going to have to make it yourself. Daniel understood the time is now. If you're lost, you need to get saved today. If you're saved, you need to give all to Jesus, not just a little bit, all to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Let's stand, please. Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach the Bible. Thank you for this great host of folks. And Lord, I know some of them are leaving, and this is late for them, but God, I only get them once a year. So, Lord, I pray that you open up their heart and help them that they might trust what the Word of God is saying to them today, what the Spirit of God is saying to them today. Save souls, revive Christians, change lives and change eternity.